Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can everyone hear me okay? AV is okay? Sounds like it, otherwise I'm really loud. How's everyone doing this morning? Awesome. Good. Nice, nice. Firstly, I want to thank all of you folks for being here, but I want to thank JP, I want to thank Jose, the volunteers, everyone for putting this together. I remember the first time or the second time you guys did this at BCS. I was there many moons ago. So it's really good to be back, and it's an honor to be standing in front of you and, and sharing the journey. So in a nutshell, I've got a very heavy digital footprint, much heavier than I am. So if you want to learn more about me, you can just scan that, or you can hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm not going to spend much time talking about me. I'm going to spend more of the time talking about what I want to talk about to you folks, which is citizen delight. Does that resonate with people? Citizen delight? One hand, no? What, two, three hands? OK. What does citizen delight mean to everyone in this room? Let's have some shout outs, please. Don't leave me hanging. What's a delight? Delight's always good. Delight's always good, right? We are all citizens of this pale blue dot. We deserve to be delighted, each and every one of us, right? For me, citizen delight means access to education, access to healthcare, uh, you know, low to no crime. No vulnerability, and more so, no marginalization, no prejudices, no biases, no bigotry. That's an ideal world, isn't it? Is it achievable? Yes. yes. Thank you. It is. It damn well is. But it's achievable in small increments. And it's achievable not by the work of institutions, because they're being at international development has been at it since the Second World War. And what I say to my friends in the international development sector is, if you guys were effective at your jobs, you'd be out of a job. Does that resonate with people? That's what we do, right? If we're effective, we do ourselves out of a job, and then we move on to the next team. So what does citizen delight actually mean? For me, it simply means that if institutions, if governments, if policies, if culture, if value, if all of these things get in the way of creating citizen delight, which is a society or a community free from marginalization, free from bigotry, free from prejudice, and inclusive, that for me creates citizen delight. But what I've been observing pretty much all my life is all of those things get in the way. And it's about time that we took a stand and we said, you know what, whatever gets in the way of creating citizen delight, it has to change. Because that's what we do in our day jobs, right? And, and that's a remix of mine on Steve Denning. So Steve Denning said something very similar where he said if processes and policies and culture gets in the way of creating customer satisfaction, then that must change. Yes, customers are important, but more important is the society we exist in. Right? I keep hearing we want to change the world of work. I don't want to change the world of work. I want to change the world that work gets done in. Does that resonate with people? Yeah? yeah? Okay, so as, as Jose kindly said, peace through prosperity. So we embarked on this journey about 12 odd years ago. And we said, okay, in order to create the citizen delight, in order to change things, we need to work as we do, bottom up and top down. 12 years ago, we started working bottom up. And what we started doing was trying to answer this question which is how might we better enable marginalized individuals to essentially create a better future for themselves? Essentially, write their own narrative of change, right? Everyone wants to be a hero in their own story, right? And there's a really cool song by Supertramp along those lines. But most of us can't because we don't know how. And that's the 99%. And when I say the 99%, I'm talking about 
our community, and that community is 8 billion people. It's not just the agile community, it's not just the lean community. That is exclusion. For me, when I say community, when I hear community, it's either all 8 billion of us or none of us. Does that resonate with people? Yeah. yeah. And that's the view. How do we enable the 99% to create their own narrative of change? That's hard. When we started looking at it, it was colossally hard, and we started looking at what do we need? We need big budgets. We need, we need scale. And then we said, no, we don't. We need to experiment, and we need to see where this can land if we did it off our own backs. And we did take sponsorship once, and that didn't go too well, because when we did take aid from an aid agency who loved our work, uh, it came with strings attached. And the first, for the first time and the last time in my life as a product owner, I felt stifled, which gave me great empathy right, with product owners in the world of work where uh, they are not empowered. They enable, but not empowered. And, and soon we broke away from that relationship because for us, our product, for peace through prosperity, it's an innovation lab. For us, our products are our big moonshots, our experiments, and those experiments cannot have strings attached to them. We need to have the liberty of doing what we feel is right, rather than being told who to work with and when and where to work with them. So the whole concept that we want to work with all 8 billion people didn't really land well with aid agencies. Right? And the whole concept of how might we scale didn't really land well with them either. Who we want to work with are these people. Anyone seen that kind of site before? Traveling out of Western Europe and North America? Right? Those are micro-entrepreneurs. Those are the backbone of every economy. And there are some of them over here as well. You just need to go to the Sunday and the weekend markets to have a look at them. And they're very hard-working people. But they have a challenge. They're not enabled. For them, it's a daily hustle. It's not a living. You either hustle or you go hungry. That's a nice place to be in. And that does not create delight for any, any citizen. So what we started doing was we started enabling them. And after 12 years, we've uh, worked with just shy of 3,000 people. These are 3,000 micro-entrepreneurs in Pakistan, in Yemen, and in Egypt. We went to Yemen in 2018. We scaled into Egypt in 2020. Um, in Egypt, we're working with the refugee community. You know, uh, this, might be, this might not be new to you, but for those who are, are going to listen to this wider, this might be news to them. But most refugees out of the Middle East and Africa don't come to Europe. They don't want to come to Europe. They want to stay close to home. So when things get better, they can go back. So they go to Egypt. They go to Nigeria. They go to South Africa, the big economies of Africa. They move to places like Pakistan, from places like Afghanistan. Why? Simply because it's proximity, it's easier to get to. They have already relations in these places where they can take refuge. And working with refugees in, 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 in Egypt, and working with conflict-affected communities in Yemen, and working with you know, people on the cusp of radicalization in Pakistan, we, we learned a lot, not just about how to transform individuals, how to transform small communities and with that society, but how to take that learning and bring it back into our world. Because how many, how many people do we come across at work who, too, are marginalized? Have you folks come across people? Right? Who feel marginalized? More often than not, right? It's amazing how the majority in an enterprise feels marginalized. Right? It's no longer, you know, the marginalized minority, it's the marginalized majority. And guess what? That is a reflection of how society is right now and is broken.
because that should not exist. For me personally, I, I, I experienced the sharp end of marginalization when I was 11 at school. Uh, it wasn't some racist kid, it was the headmaster. So I remember uh, the schools were, we had holidays because there were riots in the city, this is Karachi, and I had no idea what the riots were about, to be honest. I was an 11-year-old kid. But when we were returned to school after assembly, I got asked by the headmaster to come to her office and stand in the corner the whole day. Obviously, I've always been a troublemaker. So it's like, okay, I must have done something, and she's found out, and I've got to pay the price, you know? You do the crime, you do the time. But at the end of the day, I asked her, I was like, why exactly did I spend the whole day standing looking at a wall? And she goes, because uh, you're a Shiite. That's why. Are they okay? Like, what's a Shiite? She's like, go and find out. So, okay. So I leave, and uh, so the one day, within those 24 hours, I discovered two things. One, what does it feel like to be at the receiving end of bigotry and hate? And what is the power of community? Because as I left her office, my small posse of friends were waiting outside. They were like, dude, where were you? I was like, I was, I was in there, looking at a wall. I was like, why? I was like, apparently I did something, it's called Shiite. <laughs> They're like, what is it? I like, I don't know. So like, okay. So lunchtime conversation was interesting at home. Because I was like, hey, what's, what's a Shiite? And my brothers were like, why? And I was like, well, this is why. I like, okay. So one of my older brothers goes, we're going to drop you to school tomorrow. And I was like, okay, that doesn't sound good. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we turn up to school, obviously, my four older brothers, bless them all. And when we arrived there, there was a small army of parents. And they were the friends' parents who'd gone home and asked the same question. And they'd given the same reason. I apparently was the only Shiite in that school. Guess what happened? The community had the headmaster fired there and then. That's the power of community. Industrial. Absolutely. And what I, what, I, what I learned from that day woke something up in me. It woke up the power of community and it woke up something that was quite pissed off. The more I understood of why that had happened, the more angrier I got. Which I suppose is normal, right? It would make anyone angry. This was 1986. 1988, I attended my first protest on the streets of Karachi. This time, it was the season to hate someone else. Not Shiites. 1990, I attended my first protest in anger. Which means, I didn't freeze and I didn't flee. And leave the rest to your imagination. The very next day, so I turned home, I returned home, smelling of tear gas and covered in bruises. And I was put on a plane the very next day and shipped off home. That's when I actually learned I was born in England. I was like, what do you mean? I'm going home. This is home. This is not home, Pibet. You're causing trouble over here. <laughs> and, and I remember having a, a very hard and emotional conversation with one of my older brothers. And he said, go away, study. He goes, you know what an oak tree is? I'm like, yeah. He goes, you know why an oak tree, most oak trees survive storms? He's like, no. Because they've got strong roots. They've got a big trunk. That's why they survive storms. So he said, be an oak. Don't dwindle in the wind. If you stay around, you're becoming effective. And I was becoming effective. As a 16, 17-year-old, I could mobilize people. Now, for, for, you know, I don't know, I don't know if there's a polite way of saying this, but in Karachi, I come from a family with privilege. So when they found a privileged young man on the streets behaving exactly like how they were, with the same rage and anger as they were, they bonded with me. 
and I still do. And that became dangerous for me because my brothers got told if he's effective, then the state will take care of him. And hence, I was put on a plane. Come 1990s, I remember 95 to 97, I was protesting on the streets of London because they wanted to, and they did take our student grants away. Education at a point in time used to be free in our country. Those of you, who, who remembers free education? Yeah, they took that away. We protested against that. 2003, I was protesting against the illegal war in Iraq. So the activist was always there, but then after the illegal war in Iraq, I lost hope, and I kind of gave up. And I was like, there's no point, because if we can't change things peacefully, when we come out in our millions, which we did, then what's the hope? Very little. And then obviously for me, everything became about customer satisfaction and me delight. Right? I focused on my startups, I focused on making money. That was until 20, 2009. 2009, I was attending a remembrance march that got bombed. And I have no idea why would anyone want to bomb a remembrance march. And I walked away from it with life and limb. Many people were not that lucky. Many people around me were not that lucky. And I almost hung up my activist gloves and I said, you know what, this is not worth it. But then in 2010, unfortunately, again, the, uh, the monster of hate and bigotry visited our family. And my, one of my, excuse me, one of my older brothers was murdered by extremists. But this time, there had to be a response. Because this time, hate had come home. This time, hate had come home violently. The question was, if I play their game, I wouldn't survive a day. But then the thought was, if I could get them to play my game, we all win. Maybe some lose. But if, they can, if I can get them to play by my rules, which essentially is lean, essentially is empiricism, then we can get somewhere. So violence is not the answer. Violence begets violence. So what we did was, we came up with this. Peace through prosperity. And part of the inspiration came from how we in Britain found peace in Northern Ireland. What did we do? We created prosperity in Northern Ireland. We gave the marginalized something else to do. We gave them the ability, we enabled them to write their own narrative of change. And with that, be less influenced by the extremist narrative of change. Because that's the easiest narrative to cling on to, right? The narrative of hate is really easy. But the narrative of progressive, positive change is really difficult. After 12 years, this is what we managed to achieve through peace, through prosperity, and this is our bottom-up work to transform society. Double-digit revenue growth within three to six months, working with micro-entrepreneurs. Double-digit profitability growth. I mean, you guys tell me, you seen businesses grow this fast? I mean, it's a surprise to me. It's a surprise to some of my VC and PE friends. As a joke, I said to one, hey, I sent him, just a little snippet saying, I've got my eyes on this business. This is the growth, growth trajectory for this business. Would you guys be interested? And he was like, dude, we need to have a face-to-face. -face. Which business is this? And I showed him this picture. But like these guys, right? And he laughed. And he goes, that is really cool, man. But no, we don't invest in those kind of businesses, right? But the fact is, just a few people, that's me, that's my missus, that's our small team. We put our money where our mouth is, and we said, we're going to use whatever we know about changing individuals, changing teams, changing communities inside of enterprises, and we're going to experiment applying that in society, and let's see what happens. And it doesn't take hundreds of thousands of pounds or dollars or euros to do so. 
over the 12 years, the first few years we were doing it, uh, the cost of transforming or enabling one individual was close to about, give or take about 700 pounds over a three to six month period. Now we've got that reduced to just under 200 odd pounds, right? So it's not expensive. What I'm trying to say is that if you want to change, don't wait for the government, the institutions, for others to do it. Do it yourself because it is possible and it is financially possible, right? You just got to tighten your belt up a little which we always do when we want to spend on things we really want, right? Yes? No? Yeah. So isn't citizen delight something that we really want? Yeah? So tighten your belts up. Look at what you can do in your own community. I'm not saying, hey, come to peace through prosperity. You're welcome if you do. What I'm saying is look at your own communities. If you're Londoners, Look at the community in London. Look at the issues in London. And we have a ton of them. And think, what might we do? What might I do? Start with the I. What might I do to make a difference here? It could be something as small as making 10 minutes to sit down and have a conversation with a homeless guy, regardless of them or him or her being a crackhead or not. Why? Because that 10 minutes you're going to spend with that individual, helping them get curious about their own potential, might change their life, might change their trajectory. Don't know, it's an experiment, right? And that's what we believe in, right? Doing experiments, so experiment outside of your world of work and see what happens. The other thing we decided to do, and this is pre-COVID, was we got sick and tired, and we're still sick and tired of our politicians, right? Last year, I was talking to a friend from Pakistan, he was visiting, and we were talking about the banana republic that is Pakistan. And he said, mate, your country is just as bad as mine. In fact, we got more stability than you do in Britain. And I was like, yeah, how so? He goes, what, three prime ministers in two years, two of them unelected? He was like, who are you talking to? I was like, yeah, you know what? Yeah, you bring it home. You got more stability with an autocratic, democratic regime than we do in Britain. So we, we this, is, this is going back a few years, but late last year, we decided to bring this thing to life. And it's called Better Gov. It is about how do, we, how do we experiment social transformation, but this time, top down. There's an old Turkish proverb, which goes, the fish always rots from the head first. And that's what we're experiencing, not just in Britain but everywhere. The rise of fascism, we don't have to go far. We got a fascist for a home secretary, yep. right? Sorry, I don't know if I'm meant to say this or not, but she's a fascist. It's a fact. It's a fact. Thank you. It's a fact. She's a fascist. Suela Cruella Braveman. So we don't have to go far. We need that change now. Let me ask you this. Which job on this planet can you get and not be reviewed and not be fired for, from, for four to five years, unless you do something truly horrible, like get caught on camera shagging your secretary. <laughs> it's a member of parliament, right? That's not acceptable. We elect these individuals to govern our country on our behalf. They govern our country on someone else's behalf on the behalf of industry, on the behalf of lobbyists, sometimes domestic, sometimes foreign. That's not acceptable. So better government or better gov is all about creating that accountability. Democracy is under threat. And I think this is a room full of people who could actually do something about it. And what could we do about it? We could experiment. What we're proposing is that we want to review our members of parliament every three months. And we have the convergence of tech to do so without calling general elections or by-elections. These things over here. And if you look up the Tusk Foundation, they've done some amazing work on mobile voting. What we need is legislative change, where we need our legislators to agree that they should be open to be held to account by their electorate every three months. 
My member of parliament is a warmonger. I'm not a warmonger. Every time I've written to him and I said to him, I do not want you to vote in favor of this legislation. Guess what he has gone and done each and every time? He's gone and voted for it, right? That doesn't represent me. I've spoken to my community where I live in Tunbridge, and they said, no, we don't support that either. So who exactly is he representing? He's representing the arms industry. Right? He's representing all the lobbyists that want us to go and do these things, which are contrary to what we want to do as citizens of this country or citizens of this planet. So I would, I would encourage you folks to explore things like better gov. See how you can get engaged. Again, it's open source. It's about mobilization. It isn't about a brand. All, all I want to do really is to encourage you just a little to get curious beyond the world of work and look at the world that work gets done in. Because for me, for years, it seems as an agile coach that I'm trying to put out fires in frying pans when my entire neighborhood is on fire. Does that resonate with anyone? Yeah. yeah? So why aren't more of us doing something about it? Because we're too busy. Right? That's the honest answer, right? We're just too busy. We need to make time. Just as we go in and tell our clients that, hey, you want change, you need to create some capacity, some headspace. Remove those redundant meetings from your calendars, right? Meet with purpose. Keep a time box. Keep it short. It's the same principles. It's not rocket science. It's exactly the same stuff, just a different context. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, in terms of calls to action, I've got lots of calls to actions for you folks, right? But the main thing I want you to do is reflect on your own journeys. Reflect on who you get, who do you interact with, how might you start conversations that will get them curious about their own potential. Because that's one of the things. So between 2010 and 2012, I must have spoken to close to 500 people, mostly from marginalized, mostly from conflict-affected, and somewhat radicalized communities. And the common theme always was the inability to affect their own future. I remember having a conversation with one individual who said, I can't change my world. The world's affected by everyone else. I was like, dude, it's your world. The only thing that's holding you back from changing your world is you. So forget about everyone else. Just think about what can you do at an individual level to improve yourself, improve your business, improve your relationships with your family, with your competition, with your customers. Remove the friction in all the conversations that you are having because at the sharp end, the conversations are full of friction. I'll give you a very quick example. I go to a guy who's selling bananas, looks a bit like uh, one of these stalls, right? And I go to him, I'm like, hi, is that what you want? I go, hi. Go, what do you want? I'm like, dude, you're selling bananas. You think I'm here buying mangoes, right? Friction, immediately. And I said to him again, I was like, good afternoon. He's like, good afternoon. I was like, isn't this better? He goes, what do you want? I was like, dude, I want some bananas. I want to have a conversation with you. I said, why do you want to talk to me? I said, why are you so angry? And he goes, why wouldn't I be? I was like, well, talk to me about it. He goes, I don't have time to talk to you about it. I was like, there's no one else here. Just me, you, and the bananas, right? So how about we have a conversation? And we had a conversation. We had a delightful conversation. We had a very emotional conversation. But that is their life. It's hard, right? And what we say to them is, dude, your life is hard. So is your customers. If you come at it with that mindset, all that will happen is this, the wrong kind of friction. So just have a conversation. Just make 
10 seconds for each other. It just takes 10 seconds to say good morning. And it takes another 10 seconds to say good morning. How are you doing? It's those little things, right? It's not massive. It's those little, small, incremental things that we can do in order to affect someone else significantly. Yeah, and, 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 I, and I can't stress enough on the word significantly. Now, with peace through prosperity, the outcomes we've achieved are things like social mobility. And we've, got, we've got close to about four or 500 videos that I would encourage you to go and spend a little time at looking. And we've done some videos with people we've worked from eight years ago, five years ago. So you can see the difference between where they were and where they are now. On a very practical level, it's simply teaching people PDCA. People familiar with PDCA? I hope so. It's freaking lean and agile conference, guys. <laughs> Plan, do, check, act. On a daily basis. You start your day. Right? I'll give you another example. We got, we got a, a gentleman, again, very much like one of these guys on a mobile cart. And he's complaining his business isn't good. So, okay. Uh, what are you doing about it? He's like, I don't know. He's like, we're standing on the corner, and there's, there's a bridge, and there's a bus stop on the other side of the road. And I know exactly what he needs to do, right? I mean, what do you think you need to do? He's like, I don't know. He's like, customers aren't coming. He's like, where are the customers? He goes, they're on that side of the road. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, but your thing's got wheels on it. Do they work? He goes, yeah, of course they work. So like, what's stopping you from going on the other side? He goes, well, I'm under the bridge, so there's shade over here. I was like, yeah, but your customers are on the other side. He goes, you know what? What I could do is in the mornings, I could go to stand there in the sun. And after the rush hour is finished, I could come back over here and sit in the shade. And in the evening, I can go back there again. I was like, how about you try it and see what happens? We went back and visited him a couple of weeks later. We went to the spot. He wasn't there. We looked across the road. He was there standing in the sun with a little canopy on top of his thing. <laughs> Right? It's PDCA. We encourage them to start their day with a little bit of self-reflection. I don't need, at an individual level, to have a team to do a retrospective on how my week went. It's something I can do in my head. It helps. Occasionally, me and the missus, we have our retrospectives. But more often than not, we have our retrospectives introspectively. Sometimes we create post-its, sometimes we won't. But the point is to teach people these simple skills, these simple practices. You know, how many people are awed in this community when we say to them, just think about what went well today and what didn't go so well today. And they go like, whoa, that is mind-blowing. It is not, but for them it is, because they're so focused, they're wearing blinkers. And just that conversation with us just helps them a little bit take those blinkers off. Right? and see their surroundings a bit more clearly. It is not difficult. We run three teams. Yeah, Karachi's got six people. Yemen's got four people, and Egypt's got two. And our budget for the year is just a little shy of $30,000. Yeah, we're all scrum masters and agile coaches. We make a good living. Don't we? I thank the universe for it. Right? That, I'm not saying it's a drop in the ocean. It is a sizable part of our income. But it doesn't break our bank. It doesn't make us poor. In fact, it makes us wealthy. Beyond measure. Because the universe provides. I don't want to sound like some hippie spiritual guy, right? But the universe provides. You do good, you get good karma. Yeah, Dharma works like that. So I'm going to encourage you to look at your own communities, right? You don't have to go far because it's about fixing things locally, right? Exponentially. Because if we have everyone in this room go back and work in their own communities, spend a little bit of time in their communities, how many communities do we affect? Yeah, many. I'm not doing, going to do an estimation here, right? I could. We'd have to pull out story cards, right? 
But we'll end up affecting a lot of communities. We'll end up affecting a lot of lives. We've affected indirectly close to or a little over 17,000 lives in our 12 years. As far as I'm concerned, my job is done. One life changed is you know, equal to a thousand lives changed because it's a generational change. When we talk about social mobility, one, one, of, one of the things that I absolutely love is right this thing over here, inclusion of our participants' kids in mainstream education. By mainstream, we mean regular education, not religious education. Yeah, that changes generations. Maybe the guy won't become an engineer or a doctor this generation, but maybe the next one will. But we have stories where a fruit seller, i.e. one of these guys, has put their kid through and he's a pharmacist now. Yeah, that is, for me, that, that's the stuff that keeps me smiling and helps us sleep easy at night, right? Because, hey, we changed, we changed an entire generation. Not just one, we changed many. And I'll encourage all of you to do exactly the same. Look at your own journeys. Think about your own moonshots. But then don't stop at the freaking moon. Why? Because we've all seen this now, haven't we? Who is familiar with James Webb's telescope? Right? Familiar with that picture, folks? The universe is awesome. Just go and explore it. Thank you very much.